your power and fill this place. There's nothing I'd rather do than give him glory. And, and Pastor Karen knows there's, there's zero ounce of embarrassment for me when I'm giving God worship. Because let me tell you something. I've gone through some embarrassing things, and it's not on the level of worship. I've gone through embarrassing moments that the Lord has covered me, and it had nothing to do with worship. So when I just think about the way that God has covered me, I said, there's no way I can be in the house of God and not give him everything I have and not give him all of the glory and all of the praise. There's no reason I can't lift my hands and lift my voice, because I'll tell you right now, if the Lord didn't cover my shame, yes, God, if the Lord didn't hide me, if he didn't hide me, I'd be exposed and unable to recover. So I am unapologetically a worshiper. Is anybody in here in that same category? I am unapologetically a worshiper. It don't take anybody to get in here and get me moving or to lift me up and to drag me to the altar. I am unapologetically a worshiper because if it weren't for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? If it weren't for the Lord and his strength and his might and his healing touch, if it weren't for the Lord who was covering me in moments I couldn't cover myself, if it weren't for the Lord whose strength got me out of bed and put me back on my feet in the face of that trial and that tribulation, if it weren't for the Lord, I'd be laying a defeat. I'd be a wretch undone. So I am unapologetically a worshiper because worship doesn't come from talent. Worship doesn't come from skill. Worship doesn't come from the group. Worship doesn't come from the crowd. Worship comes from that place where you know what God has brought you through, where you know what the Lord has done for you. That's where worship comes from. Come on, somebody in here. I'm unapologetic. I will do a whole medley in here because let me tell you, the mercies of God don't just come singularly. They don't just come in one. They come in both. God has been good to me in bunches. He's delivered me in bunches. He's given me a whole musical of worship that I can put forth because the Lord is my Savior. He's my rock. He is my strong tower. He is my deliverer. He is my friend. Listen, I got a whole concert in me. How many people out there can do a concert just with the worship that God deserves from you? Come on, somebody in here. Come on, come on, come on. Listen, this is our God. This is our King. This is our Savior. This is our Redeemer. And how dare I sit back and make it somebody else's job to give him glory for me. He didn't give my paycheck away. He didn't give my healing away. He didn't give my deliverance away. He didn't give my access to the kingdom away. So how dare I put worship in somebody else's hands? How dare I put worship in the hands of the CD? How, I, how dare I put worship in the hands of the radio? How dare I put worship on the hands of Spotify and my favorite streaming services? See, worship is personal. You can't have my worship enemy. You can't delegate my worship. You can't, you can't absolutely send my worship through absentee ballot. I got to be present to worship. My mind got to be present to worship. My heart got to be present to worship because the Lord was a present help in a time of trouble. Somebody give them some worship today. Oh, we might not get to the message today because worship is ringing in the house. Worship is ringing in your life. Worship is relationship. Come on, somebody. Worship is victory. Worship is the true reality. Listen, I'll get excited. I'll get excited on y'all. 
thank you, Jesus. Come on, get take your seats if you can. Take your seats if you can. All that worship going on. I can't hardly breathe in here. Come on, take your seats if you can. All that worship going on. You you get me off of my talking points. Come on, all that worship going on. You get my mind off of my problems. You you get my mind off of my troubles. You get my mind off of the aches and pains. I got I got a little something going on in my in my body, but worship is distracting me right now. I got something that I've been trying to resolve for myself, but worship is becoming a distraction right now. I got some answers that I need the Lord to bring forward, but the questions are starting to fade because worship is taking precedence in my life. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't need a tune-up on my worship. I don't need an oil change on my worship. I don't need a new battery. I don't need an automatic start on my worship. It came with me. It came with the model that God has made in me. He made me in his image and his likeness, and the model that he made me was fully loaded, fully loaded with worship, fully loaded with praise, fully loaded with gratitude, fully loaded with victory. See, see, this model was built a little different, and worship is bringing me back to where I was. <laughs> where I was before the storm, where I was before the trial, where I was before the evil report. Come on. Worship knows how to transport you to the presence of God. Because last I checked, his presence doesn't have sickness in it. His presence doesn't have sorrow in it. In his presence, the Bible says, it's fullness of joy. Oh, come on. Come on, come on. Listen, we're going to go to the word of God. We're going to go to the word of God because I, 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 I feel like doing something a little crazy right now. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. I feel like casting my cares upon him because he cared for me. I feel like doing something a little crazy. I feel like shouting before the battle is over. I feel like doing something just a little bit crazy. I feel like praising God like the victory is already at hand. Come on, somebody. I feel like giving God glory before I see the mail come in. I feel like giving him glory before that email that I was waiting on comes in. I feel like giving God glory before that person comes to the altar crying, what must I do to be saved? I feel like doing something just a little crazy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, worship. Worship. Worship's in your living room. Worship. Worship's in your car. Worship is, is, is eternal. It's timeless. You can watch a moment right now and worship later. You can replay a video and just worship and tap right in because the spirit makes intercession. Intercession over time. Intercession over circumstance. Intercession over what don't make sense. Intercession over the interference of the enemy. Worship knows how to hover. Worship breaks through frequencies. Worship breaks through gen DNA and genetics. Worship breaks through politics. Worship breaks through racism. Worship breaks through sexism. Worship breaks through every power dynamic that the enemy has set up for you to be defeated. See, worship is the most powerful weapon that we have. That's why the Levites went forth. That's why we call for Judah, because we understand that there is a victory associated with worship. It's impossible for worship to be present and victory to be present. Victory and worship has to go together. I meant to say defeat. It's impossible for worship to be present and defeat to be present. Worship and victory come in pairs. Worship and victory are married. Worship and victory have a long-term relationship. Worship and victory have a covenant. And God honors the covenant of your worship. He honors the covenant of your sacrifice of praise. That's it. That's it. That's it. I dare you, wherever you are, whatever date it is, whatever time it is, I dare you to get lost in worship for a moment. I dare you to get lost in worship for a moment. Sometimes we need to get lost. Sometimes we need to get lost. Sometimes we need that, that GPS to be disrupted a little bit because how many people ever get lost and you found a shortcut that you never would have found before? 
How many people ever got lost and you found a restaurant that you never even heard advertised and it's, and it's better than all that junk food you've been going after? See, when you get lost in worship, lost on man's definition is found in God's definition. See, I need you to get lost a little bit because you think you control everything. You think that you are in the driver's seat of this whole thing, but every now and then I'll send worship so you can get lost, so you can get turned around, see, because I got a plan for your life. I got thoughts that I think towards you, and worship will get you there. Not worry, but worship will get you there. Come on, somebody. Come on, come on. If no man knows the mind of God, then what we know has to be lost sometimes. What we know has to be surrendered to God sometimes, and worship will get you there. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, y'all sit down. Y'all crazy. Y'all crazy. Y'all act like everything that the enemy set up isn't going to work. Y'all act like this case that he's been building for years, you acting like everything that you're predisposed to because of your DNA. You, you acting like the trauma that you went through, you can't overcome in half the amount of time. Come on, y'all acting just a little bit crazy in here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, why are you saying thank you and you still waiting on it to be manifested? Y'all acting like crazy. Why are you saying thank you and it's not in your hand right now? Why are you saying thank you and that apology hasn't come through yet? Why are you saying thank you and that turnaround hasn't come yet? Somebody say, because thy kingdom come. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. If God inhabits our praises and our worship, then, then, then worship must be an escalator to God's kingdom. It's an escalator to circumstances that haven't even hit yet. See, I don't know about you, but I like to be on the cutting edge of stuff. And worship brings you to the cutting edge, see, because if you're waiting to see something, that means somebody might beat you to it. But if you're on the cutting edge and caught in worship, that means something's going to manifest in your life that you're not even prepared for. That means something's going to manifest in your life that the enemy doesn't have a rebuttal for. That means something's going to manifest in your life that you don't even have a response to. I like being on the cutting edge, and worship gets you on the cutting edge. Worship is proactive, not reactive. Come on, somebody. Oh, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. You know you shouldn't be happy right now. You know you should be wallowing in your pity. You know you should be married to your pain. But something about worship turns that thing around. 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. I can't tell you what to do no more. I ain't even going to try. 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 10th verse. That is why, for Christ's sake, <laughs> I delight in weakness in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Have your seats. Today, the message, I think they're all simple, so I shouldn't say simple, but simple thing for us to repeat. Now, if you repeat this, I, I, I want you to believe God. I don't want you just to go through the ritual of repeating. But if, if, if you really believe God today, I want you to repeat this sermon. If you're not all the way there, we ain't going to judge you if your mouth don't move. But if you really believe God today, repeat this theme that I'm going to preach today. Pick your spots. Pick your spots. The house has been addressed. Pastor Karen, God bless you. Pillar of fire, we love you. Visitors, friends, we, we praise God for you. But to everybody under the sound of my voice, past, present, future, whatever, pick your spots. This is part three in what I'm now starting to feel should be called the thinking series. I'm cataloging all of these sermons and messages, and I'm trying to group them in a way that we can come back to and revisit. Because I don't believe that when, when the Lord imparts to us that we just move on to the next one. 
I believe that there's going to be a time for us to circle back and break back into pieces that the Lord has shared with us. That way, in due season, we can get the benefit. But I'm starting to call these last three messages the thinking series. The first being surface level thinking. The second being thought partners. And the third being today, pick your spots. We're going to talk about Jacob and Laban in Genesis, the 29th chapter. Crash course in history, Jacob fell in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. Rachel's father, Laban, tricked Jacob into working seven years for who Jacob thought was going to be Rachel. But after the seven years of work, Laban offered Jacob Leah, Rachel's older sister. So then, fast forwarding through the text, Laban told Jacob that if he worked seven more years at Jacob's request, he could then have the bride he wanted, which was Rachel. That's a rough start to a relationship with your father-in-law, right? <laughs> he ain't looking at nobody. Ain't looking at nobody. But that's a rough start to be in agreement, or in your mind, you were in agreement on something, and then for that to be undercut and you to be tricked and, and information to be withheld and disclosed, that's tough. That's tough to get over. But Jacob focused on what it is that his heart desired. So after working seven years to get the bride he thought, he got the big sister and he wanted the little sister. <laughs> So then he enters this agreement. He works seven more years for the little sister. And I really love the fact that Jacob didn't get all crazy on Laban. Jacob could have went up to Laban and said, man, you know what the deal was. You know what we agreed to. And after seven years, you mean after every dinner that we had, every time we crossed each other, after every time we was watching the young boys arm wrestle, after every time we showed up at the pig pen at the same time, there's not once that you could have taken the opportunity to clarify this deal. I feel like Laban had to be misleading Jacob for a long time for this to occur. We talking about seven years of interaction. And now all of a sudden Laban's like, oh, no, it's our custom to blah, 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 blah. Really? Okay. But I love the fact that Jacob did something that most of us don't have the strength to do. Jacob didn't go crazy. He was well within his right to go off and, and start sprinkling, you know, uh, <laughs> no, I ain't going to suggest that crazy to nobody, but start doing things to Laban's property and start letting those sheep and those cattle gates open. And I don't, I don't know where they went. They just started disappearing. He didn't get even. He focused on what it is that he wanted. And I feel like a lot of times the enemy has us so distracted with trying to get even, we lose our focus on the thing we say we want. Yeah, we're not treated right. Yeah, I, I understand that it's unfair and you might be justified in retaliating. However, the whole point of me being in, in, in contact with Laban, if I'm Jacob, is to get the thing I wanted, not to get even. And look at how the enemy shifts our perspective sometimes where we're not focused on the thing that we want. We focus on getting even. 1 Peter 3 and 9 uh, indicates to us uh, very clearly that our job is not to repay evil for evil because we're different. We say we're different. We say we're children of God. So that means when we're pressed into situations to respond differently, what should we do? Respond differently. We're not just God's children when things are going well. And, and now all of a sudden, because I have justification, I get to behave the same as everyone even when I have justification, because I'm different, I have to do different. Even though I'm in the right, because I'm different, I have to do different. Even though people know that this person got a history of snaking folks, if I'm different, I have to do different. See, the tools of yesterday are, are things that we have to really start to understand because the tools of yesterday become tomorrow's victory. And the key in understanding the tools that God has already put in our hands is timing. 
See, Jacob had all sorts of tools in his arsenal on how to respond to Laban, but until the situation comes forth where the tools are called upon, Jacob doesn't reach for them. Because if you know anything about Jacob's birth, Jacob had all sorts of crazy little things in his history with his brother and all kind of crazy things that he observed from his mother. But not until the time uh, 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 that was presented for Jacob to actually move forth on his own, move forth in his destiny and purpose, not until that time did those tools become relevant for him. Timing is keys for the tools that God has placed in us. And sometimes we get frustrated because we might sense skill or ability or we might have a comment or a response or a strategy but until the timing is there those tools cannot be effective see because tools take time and 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 time is where God is when he deals with man he knows that since he sits out of time he has to help us understand time by coming in time and on time. Does that make sense? God is not restricted to time, but for us, he has to come in time and on time to help us manage because we are built with an expiration date, whereas he is eternal and everlasting. So timing is my point here. Timing is key, especially for the tools that we need to move into our destiny. And for Jacob, it was always only a matter of time. Seven years to get to get uh, who he thought he was going to get turned into seven years for who he didn't want, but what he thought he was going to get in seven years was was for 14 years, but we're going to find out that there was more that Jacob was going to get than just his bride-to-be, because if he would have got, oh, somebody jumped ahead of me, if he would have got his bride in seven years, there's a whole lot of stuff we're going to talk about that wouldn't have come along with her. So we got to understand that the key is timing. Somebody say the key is timing. See, timing is important because timing also is in relationship with planning. And I want you to understand today that when you have a plan, you have timing. People who don't have a plan don't have good timing. But people who have a plan have good timing. See, because I got a plan for my day, I got good timing. Because to execute my plan, I have to get my kids up on time. I got to get one dropped off at school on time. I got to hit traffic in the expressway at a certain time, to get off on my exit at a certain time, to be able to get to the parking lot at a certain time, to be able to make the walk up to my building at a certain time, to be able to put my key in the door at a certain time, to be able to sit down at my laptop at a certain time, to give it a certain time to turn over until it comes on and I can log into what I need before the first time of my first meeting. See, when you have a plan, there's timing that always goes with that plan. And if anybody in this room has plans with no timing, I encourage you to go home and just put a template of time on it because anything that you are planning requires timing. So you have to put time even if you adjust the time. Even if you say, I thought this was going to take 10 years or 7 years or 14 years, at least put time on it so you can change the timing because until you put timing on it, you don't understand the amount of time it's going to take. So if you don't put time on it, you won't even know that the time you put on it isn't the amount of time that you need. The amount of time that you need is revealed when you first try to put time to it. And then you recognize as you work in the plan, I need more time or I could do this faster and it's going to be a shorter amount of time, which then gives me time to do some other things. See, everybody who has a plan needs timing. See, when you have a plan, you have timing. And and when we understand that we have both a plan and timing, we can't afford to be lured or provoked or baited into a losing situation. Because when you bring me into your situation with the things that you got going on, if it's not a part of my plan, and if it's not within the timing that's going with my plan, you're actually luring me into a losing situation because I need time to do my plan. Now, I'm not saying that the Lord doesn't disrupt or the Lord doesn't reveal or unveil things that maybe we didn't know in the beginning, but even how you deal with people has to come with a mindfulness of plan and time. See, because I got a plan for my life, when you cut me off in traffic, I got timing because I need to be there for my sons when they're in middle school, and I got to be there for my sons when they're in high school, and and I want to be there on the day that they're married, and I want to be there on the day that they have children. So because I have a plan and a timing, because you want to lure me into an argument because you cut me off in traffic, I go back to my plan, and I go back to time, and I say, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to argue with you. I don't have time to figure out 
figure out if you're in the car by yourself. I don't have time to figure out if you have a weapon on you. I don't have time to figure out if you're in the right state of mind. So because I have a plan and because I have timing, the way that I go about my day is completely different. You cannot lure me into a losing situation because I understand my plan, I understand the time, and you in this situation are not in it. And God has given us dominion and authority over plan and time until he comes in and says, it's a new plan. Just the other day, I found myself here at the church and I was working. And, and I got through some of the things that I needed to get through a little faster than usual. So I called my wife and I, and I was going to ask her, did you want me to come home early? And until she actually answered the phone, which she didn't, and until she actually called me back, I'm going to continue with the plan that I started with. I'm going to continue doing the things that I need to because I already have plan and timing. And until I get new information from the authority, I have to stay put and occupy until he comes. Does that make sense to anybody? See, the enemy wants to entrap us into making all kind of reckless decisions in our life. And until we really understand that plan and timing are within our dominion until the greater authority tells us otherwise, then we're going to continue to make missteps and we're going to find ourselves in arguments and find ourselves in unproductive situations. And, and I just told somebody the other day, you could get in a fight with somebody and you can absolutely win decisively and they're still going to run their mouth as you're walking away even though you won. So I'm not going to put myself in an unproductive situation situation because I understand that I have plan and I have timing. <clears throat> See, we can't afford to be lured, provoked, and baited into losing situations. And, and when the time is right, God will issue us an invitation as opposed to provocation. See, some of us are living our lives being provoked instead of invited. God invites you into a plan. God invites you into a goal. God invites you into a vision. God invites you to anything that he wants you to be a part of. But if you live your life responding to being provoked, you are not in the will of God. If you live your life responding to everything that pokes at you and, and challenges your ego and, and everything that, that baits you into getting money very quickly with little effort, if you find yourself being provoked, you're going to find yourself out of God's will because God has always operated by invitation and not provocation. See, provocation equals reaction. Being provoked is a reactive thing. You're, you're fighting on someone else's terms and you're not under the terms of God. You're fighting in your own name and for your own ego, not for the purposes of God when you're provoked. When you're provoked, you are at the enemy's convenience. And let me tell you something, even the enemy understands time. Because when the when, when the demons were occupying the swine and Jesus came, they, they screamed out and called out to him that it's not our time yet. Even the enemy understands that this auspice of time and, and this paradigm of time absolutely is essential for what they do and the time that they have to cause the damage they can cause. So if the enemy understands time and he provokes you, guess what? He's ready for the fight and you aren't. If he provokes you into a situation where you're reacting and somebody gets on your nerves, are you ready to put in your resignation letter? You didn't go to God in prayer. He hasn't sent you any signs. You have been provoked. And because you've been provoked, the action, even if justified, is going to bring you out of the will of God because God operates on the premise of time with us. God invites us to situations. It's a lifestyle of invitation and not a lifestyle of provocation. See, we have to understand that there's a difference between the decisions that we can make and what God's perfect will is. He will permit us to do things, but there is a perfect will, and that perfect will is by invitation and not provocation. And when we understand the difference, then we really start moving under God's true blessing because even as saints of God, even as Christians, sometimes we find ourselves trying to force God's invitation when he hasn't really invited us because we have to understand that it takes God's authority to issue an invitation. You can't come to my house because you decide to. And there's some people in the room who can even tell you, I will tell a person, I did not invite you and you cannot come over just because you're in your car, just because you're on the way. I don't care the circumstance. If you are not invited, you cannot come to my house. So I will bother you. I will disrupt you. I will love on you. But I have a home that is built upon invitation and not provocation. You can't provoke me 
me into something I want, don't want to do. You can't provoke me into a relationship I don't want to have. You can't provoke me in making a decision over my life that God hasn't sanctioned because I understand it is God's authority that issues the invitation. And that's why I say to God, we have to be very careful because we cannot decree and declare on our own authority. We cannot decree or declare on our own authority. We can only decree and declare what God has already said because his authority is the invitation. See, we can ask, but asking is only asking until God responds. So we have to even be very careful how we navigate because God operates by invitation. See, see, I didn't pick what I'm doing. I didn't pick this ministry. I didn't pick a time to pastor. I didn't pick this city. This was by God's invitation. I can't provoke God into coming down and blessing what I decided I was going to do on my own. God has invited me, and because he invited me, I respond with my willingness I respond with my obedience. I respond with my sacrifice because God is a God of invitation. And when God invites you, whether you're ready or not, it is time to move. When God invites you, that means he created the circumstance. He created the terms. He created everything that you need to satisfy the calling because he won't invite you without giving you provision. He won't invite you without giving you protection. He won't invite you without giving you the true resources that you need. So we have to understand that we have to stand on the authority of God and there's nothing that we can decree or declare on our authority that God is going to bless. God moves by invitation. I'll give you an example. Let's go to the word. So Joshua, the 14th chapter and the 12th verse. Now, now we can hear and we recite sometimes when we've heard Caleb say, God, give me this hill. Give me this mountain. But I want you to understand that Caleb wasn't decreeing or declaring something. He was on his own authority. He was decreeing and declaring what the Lord said first. So Joshua, the 14th chapter. Caleb is saying, now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. It lets me know that even before he said, give me, there was a promise. It's very clear. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and the Anakites were giants, by the way, and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as, here's the key, he said. God operates by invitation. See, Caleb said what we can say. We can say, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Because God has already made a promise. He's already had ideas for us. He's already laid a path. He understands our heart's desires. He understands the way that we're going to move in our life. And God will issue a promise to us, which is an invitation for us to take hold and then take action. So then to back it up, we go to Numbers, the 14th chapter, the 24th verse. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit. We talked about being different earlier. Because Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him in the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. That is back in numbers. So we hear Caleb saying later what the Lord God has already invited him to. I want you to understand that there are desires in your heart. There are dreams that are in your dreams. There are visions that God has given you and he's invited you to even have the desires that you have. And when God has invited you He's absolutely supplied it because it is his invitation that we stand on. And then we can decree. And then we can declare because it is based on the authority of God. So I'm not going to live my life being provoked by the enemy, even trying to decree and declare something because I'm waiting for the season to end. And I'm waiting for the turnaround to come. And I'm sick of suffering. And I'm sick of going through. And I'm sick of being lonely. And I'm sick of being financially strapped. I'm not going to be baited into decreeing and declaring something that the Lord has not invited me to because if it is God's will on my life and his authority it's good for me to be afflicted it's good for me to go through what I'm going through this season is designed for me to be in isolation because the Lord is speaking to me he's sending me a download he's getting me ready he's not exposing me before I'm ready to go forward he's not going to put me out in a fight that I'm not prepared for but if I go out there by the enemy's provocation then I'm going to find myself in a losing situation but when I step out on God's invitation. I know I'm stepping out and I'm going to win because the Lord on his authority has taken care of me. 
See, this is why we have to be so careful because we just want to make it what we want to make it. And, and I understand, I really relate to the human experience and the human sentiment because I go through the same things. But we have to find ourselves being careful. And like Jacob and Laban, Jacob in his heart could be mad as he wants to at Laban for tricking him. But if God didn't invite you into a fight, don't go into it. If God didn't invite you into retribution or revenge, don't go into it. If God didn't invite you just to hang it up and quit, then don't hang up and quit because God will only invite you to his perfect will. So we say to ourselves when we hear people doing good and we see people doing good and we, and we see what's in the word of the Lord, what we say to ourselves is, what about me? Why not me? How come they and not me? Why does my path have to be this way? Can't it just be this and this and not this? See, we find ourselves asking a question, and the answer that the Lord is giving us today is it's a matter of time. Why not you? Because it's a matter of time. Jacob deserved his bride. He did the work. He held up his end of the contract, but it wasn't time. See, I want you to understand the difficulty here because it might be fair, you might deserve it, it might be just, it might be time, you might feel like it's in your season. God maybe has made a way that you can see, but if it's not time, it's not time. See, God can make a way even when things aren't seen the way that you need them to look, the, where the provision isn't made in the way that you can see it, and it's still time. The enemy likes to trick us because he wants to show us a certain perspective, and we feel like it's time and that's how he's provoking us he can make everything seem right that supervisor is gone you're the senior one on the job you got all the experience you've trained the person who's supposed to be training you and the enemy has made it so clear that it's your time and when you don't get promoted or you don't get that job then we get all upset and we're ready to quit but you don't understand that there's going to be a merger of departments there's going to be an acquisition by a bigger company and you can step into that supervisor role and lose all of your privilege and lose all of your senior status, or you can understand that it's a matter of time and know that God sees something that you don't see. What Jacob saw was, this is unfair. He tricked me. I deserve what I work for. But sometimes you don't get what you work for. Sometimes you don't get what you deserve. Because what you deserve in your mind is a minuscule perspective when God sees you greater. So if you get what you deserve in a certain season in your life, you will fall short of what God wants you to deserve because he sees you beyond that present season. I need somebody to catch a hold of that. See, what you deserve is built on the perspective of you in this season. But what God says you deserve is built on you in another season. So you might get something that's going to be beneath you in a week. You might get something now that's going to have an expiration date in just a year. You might move into something that might feel satisfying and it might feel affirming right now, but there's another season ahead. So it is a good thing when you don't get what you deserve. It is a good thing when you don't get what you work for because God will give you houses that you didn't work for. God will bless you to have things that you didn't go and acquire and work for. So for Jacob, the fact that he was content in the state that he was in and he didn't get what he deserved and he didn't didn't get what he worked for, set him up for something bigger. And God is setting you up for something bigger. He wants you to have more than what you work for. He wants you to have more than what you deserve. He wants you to have something bigger. But we have to find ourselves in the position of accepting and responding to God's invitation or else what we get will only be satisfying for a season. That relationship will flame out. That car is going to uh, start acting crazy and, and, and you're going to find all sorts of things that just cost too much to maintain because we wanted to be satisfied based off of what we deserved and worked for. But God wants you to have more. He wants you to have greater. He wants you to have abundance and that is not built on our individual perspective. See, it's a matter of timing. Joel, the third chapter in the 10th verse after God's invitation, Joel prophesies this in the 10th verse. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. And this is where we get this. Let the weakling say, I am strong. I want you to understand that plowshares in the scripture, plowshares are used to cut soil. It's a farmer's tool. And, and Joel, after God's invitation, is prophesying to the people of God to beat their farmer's tool into a sword because the season has shifted from farming and harvesting to fighting and defending. 
and expanding and claiming. But the same tool that was in your hand to actually farm with is a tool that can be used for warfare. What's the difference in the tool? A matter of time. What God has put in Jacob in one season in his life will come to his defense in another season of his life. What Jacob tried to do in fighting back and forth with his brother Esau has been repressed now to the point where he comes up against a greater opponent who was his cousin Laban. And what was a plowshare in one season can be beat over the years and refined in the patience and, and, and the grace and the mercy and the temperance and the long suffering has been beat over time and next thing you know you're carrying a sword and in the season that you need it you'll actually be able to defend yourselves but let me tell you something if you find yourself holding and handling a plowshare don't you go out and buy a sword because there's a big difference between a piece of metal that's been proven and refined and strengthened over time that hasn't been dulled by battle after battle after battle when that plowshare has been beaten into a sword it's actually stronger than a sword that's been through battle God God has put in you exactly what you needed and it's been beat up over time and it's absolutely been used in ways that you think might not be productive for the season that you're in, but it's only a matter of time. When I see somebody pushing a plow, I don't consider that person to be a warrior, but the Lord says, oh, your muscles are right, your coordination is right, your balance is right, your vision is right, and your tool is right. So in the season, while you might be looking like you're a farmer and it might be intimidating to come up against a trial and a tribulation that looks like a soldier, that farmer is going to beat the soldier 10 times out of 10 because he was invited to go to warfare. Soldiers are invited through obedience and they're provoked into war by certain actions but farmers don't become soldiers until God invites them to it. And I want you to understand that the reason why you're not built like other people are built, why you're a farmer in a certain season and it seems like I'm passive and it seems like I'm docile and it seems like people are walking over me? Well, I'm a farmer in this season, but I'm going to be a warrior in the next season. And you can look at me and you can let the smooth taste fool you if you want. But when God has invited me to go to war, I'm going to tell you, you've got to fight on your hands because it's only been a matter of time. I might be peaceful, but I'm prepared. I might have that switch that can be flipped. And, and it's not about technique and it's not even about training. It's about the fact that I am coming to war on God's authority. So I want you to understand that Jacob even understood the premise that Joel was talking about where the plowshare in one season becomes a sword in the next and Jacob and everything that was in his system and spirit and mind and heart in one season became what delivered him in the next season. See, I want you to understand that, that today we are trying to get to the place where we know how and when to pick our spots. We're talking about God's invitation versus provocation. We're talking about moving on the authority of God and not being provoked into a fight or a battle that we're not really ready for when the enemy shows up. See, because Jacob was finally breaking free from a toxic connection with his father-in-law Laban. And after 14 years of service after being tricked, Jacob wasn't just about to leave empty-handed. And certainly he could have left with just Rachel, or excuse me, with Leah when he was promised Rachel. But, but he had something in his mind that said, well, God, I'm trying to get even. I'm absolutely not about to leave here empty-handed. And what the enemy might have meant for my evil, I believe you can turn around for my good. So, so when Jacob presented Laban with the deal, he serves his 14 years. And he not only had the first wife, Leah, but after the seven additional years working, he ended up getting Rachel. And right after Jacob had his last son, he said, you know what, Laban, let's make a deal. Now, I want you to understand how God's invitation is so intricate. Why would Jacob want to make a deal with a person who makes shady deals? Why would God send Jacob back to the person who tricked him? Why would he send him back to the person who hurt him, the person who deceived him? Because now he's going on God's invitation. So Jacob made a deal with Laban. And Jacob said, okay, Laban, it's time for me to go. I've worked 14 years. I got the woman I came to get, and now it's time to go. So Laban says, well, what can I give you? And Jacob's thinking in my mind, like, if you offer me something, it has to be a trick to it. So Jacob took control of the situation. And Jacob says, let me take a small number of spotted, striped, speckled, and dark 
sheep, lambs, and goats. It's been my job to take care of all of yours, and you've seen how well I've done. Your herds and your flocks have multiplied. I guess technically they're flocks. They've multiplied, and the minority of them are spotted, speckled, striped, and dark. And if I'm, if I'm thinking about this perspective, I'm not going to ask for the lion's share. And I don't even know how to give a man who's a trickster himself a number. So I'm just going to say, give me the undesirable. Give me the minority. Give me what you don't really need. Give me what you don't want. As a matter of fact, I'll put you in a position where you have bragging rights and what's left is pure. I'll give you the greater. Jacob asked for the lesser. And Laban agrees. So Jacob, in his mind, is moving. And he takes fresh cut branches from three different types of trees. And he peels those branches to expose the inner white wood. And ultimately, these branches look speckled. He peeled them. Just imagine this, right? If you have a branch, it's brown. It's kind of dirty. It might have different shades of brown, but when you peel it and you expose white, now you got brown, white, brown, white, black spot, brown, white, brown, white, black spot. He peels the branches to mimic the thing that he's taking ownership of. So as he peels those branches, he decided that what he's going to do is actually place those branches in the watering troughs. Now, when the animals came to drink, they were comfortable. They were in congregation and community. They might have been separated all day. But when they all show up to one watering source, it's likely that they're going to mate because the males and the females might not be hanging out together. And when everybody's good and full and comfortable, it's a kid's show, they're going to mate. And he wants them to mate in front of these branches. So I want you to understand what he did here. He places these speckled branches that mirror the speckled sheep, lambs, and goats that he has he puts them in the watering troughs, and they mate looking at the thing that he has claimed ownership over. Now, by selecting the minority of the flock, I want you to know that Jacob recognized something that we have to recognize today, which is it's God that makes things great. See, in Laban's perspective, the fact that the pure color uh, uh, flock outnumbered the speckled, they were the greater. The fact that pure was valued above the speckle makes them greater. But God said, hmm, Jacob, if I'm your God and if you can trust me, then just build on my invitation. So he invites Laban to see the same thing from a different perspective. And he says, okay, you got the great and I got the lesser. But in all actuality, if God is with me, whatever he puts in my hands will be great. I want you all to understand that as he selected this, now all of a sudden he gets strategy. And the strategy went with his accepting that it wasn't his reaction or his response, and it wasn't vengeance, and it wasn't retaliation that was going to make the difference. It had to be God that was going to make the difference. So Jacob stands on his faith, and he invites Laban into a deal that's a faith deal. And as he has a faith deal, then guess what? God gives him strategy. It wasn't just a miracle overnight where God said, boom, your flock, the speckled, the, the, the striped, and the spotted are absolutely multiplied all of a sudden overnight. He actually gives him a strategy to execute to go along with his faith, point number two. So then as he's moving in the strategy, he actually takes the strong of them. And strong, he's saying, by stature. By size, they don't look weak. They're not feeble. They're not moving all slow and gingerly, and it looks like they're on their lax days. And he only starts to mate the strong. And then he separates all of the flock that is the offspring of the mating away from Laban's flock. He doesn't want anything to do with Laban. He doesn't want anything to do with what was deceitful. He doesn't want anything to do. See, because when God brings you through a new season, he empowers us to do better. 
He empowers us to do things differently. And while we might be looking at other people and we're saying to ourselves, well, wow, if they're in a position of power and they navigate things this way, it's easy for us to be tempted to behave like the people who have hurt us. So Jacob makes a declaration by separating them, by saying, Laban, everything that's connected to your evil spirit, you keep. And I will take what God gives me and I will be content with that. So now the flock starts to change. And every single offspring that comes forth is spotted, striped, and speckled. And now all of a sudden, what seemed to be the smallest part of the flock, what seemed to be the weakest of the flock, actually becomes the stronger. And they outnumber Laban's. God turns what seems like uh, uh, was lack He turns what seems to be hopeless. He takes what seems to be disadvantage, and he moves it to Jacob's advantage. See, because as people of God, we have to move different. We have to decide that we choose God. We have to decide that we choose his path. We have to become one and at peace with what God has provided in the circumstances that we're in. Because once we decide that it is God that's going to either make us great or not, God can do something different. See, the problem is we're so tempted to go after things that are already great. We're so tempted to go after things that already seem complete. We are so tempted to go after things that seem like they don't take any work. Or take the least amount of work. But we have to decide that we want God. We want God's hand on our life. We want God's presence. We want God's favor. We want God's relationship. And when we decide that we want God, we're okay with lesser. Because if God is in it, I value God over great. I value God over money. I value God over reputation. I value God over vengeance. I follow God, and I will value God over every single thing that the world is prioritizing. And because Jacob prioritized God over great, he gave him great. He gave him abundance. He invited him to a life that he never even could have asked for or obtained himself. And I want you to understand the secret in this story because there's a lot of opinions Rather, the tactics of Jacob were superstitious. It's like, now, wait a minute. You put these peeled brushes that look like speckled sheep and lamb in the water troughs. They made it. You separated the strong from the weak. You separated Laban's from what was born as offspring of your strategy. And it seems superstitious. Like, what did the branches do? But I want you to understand there's a difference between superstition and supernatural. See, as saints of God... It's about the supernatural and not the superstitious. It's not about what colors we wear to church. It's not about communion on first Sunday. It's not about all of these things that we create in protocols. And when we greet each other, we say, I'm blessed and highly favored and all of this jargon. It's not about the superstition. It's actually about the supernatural because superstition is a belief that's not based on reason or knowledge. That's superstition. But let me tell you, supernatural is simply above natural and pertaining to a characteristic of God. God isn't without reason. God isn't without knowledge. We know that reason and knowledge point to God. But superstition is all these things that we say, well, if I don't do this and if I'm not friends with them and if I don't call them back and if I don't show up at this barbecue and if I don't do this, that, we create all of this superstition and now we're leading lives that's pulling us away from the blessings that God has for us. But when we have our faith that God has to do something above natural, it can't be about what I achieve. It can't be about what I obtain. It's not about my strategy. It's not about the words that I choose. It's not about the way that I go about it. It's not about working this amount of time. It's not about putting this in my retirement and savings plan. It's not about what the stock market is doing. It is about I need something above every natural means. I need something that is above every authority. I know I need something that's above my comfort. I need something that's above my peace of mind. I need something that's above my day to day. I need something that's above relationship. I need something that's above companionship. I need something that's above what you can see. I need something that's above what I can even 
even ask. I actually need God to intervene. And when we pick the supernatural over the superstition, God does some stuff that's going to spook a whole lot of people. See, it's, it's, the, it's, it's all about the faith that we have that's in a God that's above it all because faith is in the size of the grain of a mustard seed. See, God wants us to have small faith to fuel big outcomes. It's not about having faith that the big thing can be done. It's about using small faith to ask for big things because God only invites you to the big, but he doesn't require you to be big. He doesn't require you to be at the stature of your opponent. He doesn't require you to be at the stature of your enemy. He doesn't require you to have the time to figure it out. He doesn't require you to have all of the solutions. He just requires small faith for big outcomes. Somebody say small faith, big outcomes. See, you have to learn how to pick your spots. See, this was a moment where Jacob could have said, my solution is going to be violence. I'm going to go to war. I'm going to figure out how to assassinate Laban. I'm going to argue myself and get some people together who believe in what I believe. It's about shaming him. It's about sabotaging his flock. No, Jacob was trustworthy even though he was tricked. Come on, somebody. Jacob was integral even though his integrity was violated. Jacob was patient even though his patience was pushed to the limit. Jacob was the type of person who satisfied himself on being pleasing in God's sight, and he valued God's great above anything else. So, so this is the spot that Jacob has to make a decision. See, this is the spot in your life. This is the spot where either you believe that God is a deliverer or you don't. Either you believe he's a miracle worker or you don't. Either you believe that it's the doctor's report or you believe that it's God who's guiding the doctor. This is the spot. This is the spot where you believe that God is greater than your job and greater than your, your financial stability. This is the spot. This is the spot where you either say to yourself that I'm more interested in being aligned with my family, I'm more interested in being aligned with my friends, or I'm more interested in being aligned with God, even if that alienates me. See, this is the spot. This is the spot where you have to pick the will of God. This is the spot where you have to stand on your faith. This is the spot where you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. And because this is the spot God's going to do something with your spots. He's not just going to leave your spots. He's not going to let you stand on your own. He's not just going to have you defending yourself. He's actually going to defend the spot that you pick because other people are picking the easier path. Other people are picking the tools and the weapons of the enemy. They're picking the tools of the time. Other people are picking the things that they've been peer pressured in. Other people are picking the morality of the times. Other people are picking the morality of the politics. Other people are picking the easy way out because I want you to understand the world is always going to give us the easy way out. It's always going to say, well, in this moment it makes sense. And, and in this moment you can let your morals down and your standards down. And It's not about faith and religion and spirituality right now. It's about human rights. See, I want you to understand that this is all about picking the spot, and God is going to defend you when you pick your spot. He's not just going to defend you when you pick your spot, but he's also going to replicate it. He's going to say, well, if what you want is increase, I'm going to give you increase. But if you want what people have, then you're going to have everything that people got and the things you didn't know that they got, right? Uh, I'd rather pick this spot and say, for God, I live, and God, I die. I'd rather pick the spot and say, God, I'm going to fly your bloodstained banner and that's just going to be what it is. If it costs me a promotion, if it costs me a seat in the city council, if it costs me my advancement, if it costs me things that I can do to get ahead because I've seen other people use those strategies, it's going to cost me because this is the spot that I pick. And God in turn once you pick a spot and you choose to stand and you choose to be faithful, God is going to be your defender. He's going to be your defender. He's going to be your defense. He's going to be your barrier. He's going to be your hedge. He's going to be your justification and other people are going to look and they're going to say I should have did it that way because I want you to know something if Jacob would have settled and he didn't pick a spot to stand for God all he would have had was Leah in seven years where he was bitter but because he picked a spot to stand and say God I'm not going to let Laban push me out of here I'm not going to let the situation frustrate me and provoke me into doing something and being who you didn't call me to be I'm going to stand and believe that this situation has to work out for my 
my good, and it might have cost me 14 years, but now all of a sudden the flock is going to turn. The flock is going to switch. And if I would have just left, I only would have had a wife that I deserved through the work. But the person that I wanted, and I get the wealth to go along with it, and I actually have her sister, and I actually have the servants that go along with it, God was setting Jacob up from the very beginning for something that Jacob didn't even ask for. And if God only would have given Jacob what he asked for, all he would have came with was Rachel. But he got Rachel and Leah and livestock and wealth and servants, and he left with a clean record. Somebody understand that when God does something, he does it clean. When God does something, there's no retribution coming for you. You ain't got to turn and look over your shoulder. See, Jacob could have taken action against Laban, but he would have been like he was when he fought with Esau, and he would have been running for his whole life. So he actually left with a clean record. He didn't have to worry about hiding from Laban. He didn't have to worry about Laban's servants. He didn't have to worry about Laban's allies. He got two wives, both of his daughters, all of the livestock, all of the wealth, and he got the opportunity to have a peaceful night of sleep because when God does something, he gives you peace. When God gives you something, he doesn't give you buyer's remorse. When God gives you something, he doesn't give you investor's remorse. Jacob left with peace because it was God that delivered it. I need somebody just to tap in on faith today that says, I'm going to pick my spot. I'm going to pick this very moment to stand up for what God has absolutely stood up for in me, and I'm going to be faithful to him even when it's not convenient. I'm going to be faithful to God when I see people doing things other ways. I'm going to be faithful to God, even when it seems like that the enemy is camping against me and making a case, I'm going to be faithful to God when I deserve revenge. I'm going to be faithful to God when I've been looked over and passed over. I'm going to go back and make a deal with the person who tricked me because this is the spot that I pick to stand and be who God has called me to be. Somebody in faith pick that spot in your life and say, you know what? It's easy for me to drink. It's easy for me to use drugs. It's easy for me to let down my morals. It's easy for me to let down my standard just so I can hang out with them and not be alone on a Friday night. But this is the spot. I am going to pick my spot and God, I believe that this spot is bigger than this spot. I believe that my spot has a spot. And I believe that that spot has a spot. And I believe that greater is you that's in me than he who is in the world. See, I am going to pick my spot today and I'm going to make God proud. And if I have to go down, I'm going down on, on the accountability of God. I'm going down on my faith and my belief and dedication to God. If I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down in my obedience to his invitation. You're not going to provoke me. You're not going to trick me. You're not going to get me off my square. You're not going to pressure me. This is the spot that I pick to stand up for what God has for me because what God has for me, you can't see on the surface. What God has for me, you can't even compare to. What God has for me is so out of the box. It's so beyond. You're going to call it superstition. You're going to call it some kind of trick or some kind of magic, but all it is is me picking a spot. When you pick a spot, God picks you. When you pick a standard to hold to, God picks you. When you pick him over anything that you can want and ask for, God picks you. But you got to pick your spot. You have to pick your spot. We're looking for God to move in so many different areas in our life, but we end up being so, so consumed in getting the thing we missed the point. And the point is our relationship with him. The point is that he died and sacrificed himself. He loved us so much that he gave his own son. And we get so caught up chasing the stuff that we miss the point. But the spot that Jacob picked was God. If I'm in a losing situation, I'm with you. If I'm in a situation where people laugh and say, you know, you could have got more. You know, if you would have just did these other things, then you could have got that back. You could have got even. But I got to pick this spot just to stand for him. I'm only him because I'm only here because of him. In him, I live. In him, I move. In him, I have my being. And if I get so caught up in this life just chasing stuff, I miss my spot. And when you miss your spot, it's not just here. It's in the kingdom. When you miss your spot, that sacrifice becomes null and void. When you miss that spot, everything that God has provided and laid up for you, you forfeit it because you chose to get it your way. Jacob picked what seemed like the lesser path. 
he stayed. He was faithful. He was integral. He kept, he kept showing up to work. He kept doing a good job. He didn't sabotage the people that did him wrong because he picked a spot. The spot that he picked was God. This is time to pick our spot. And we have to say, there's things I've been praying for. There's things I've been waiting to turn around. There's things that I've been hoping for. There's things that have been bothering me. But if it's your will, let your will be done. Because I'm picking this spot. They can have all that other stuff. I'm picking this spot. And that's what we're here to do. And when we pick the spot, God picks us. God favored Jacob. God honored Jacob. He defended Jacob. But it wasn't on the terms that Jacob was looking for. It wasn't even in the season that Jacob was looking for defense. God defended Jacob seven years later. <laughs> we heard the message delayed but not denied. Seven years later, he justifies it. But we fall under, and y'all have heard me say it before, we fall under so much pressure because social media, we got to put it uh, into the chapter today. I went through this and this is what it means. I went through this and this is what God is saying. I don't know about that. It might be seven years and then the Lord will say, now you see. But if we're caught looking for the justification, if we're caught looking for the satisfaction, if we're caught trying to just prove to somebody that we're more than just what that moment looked like, we missed the spot. But we got to pick our spots. And it's not just once. We have a whole lifetime to navigate. But when we pick God, when we accept his invitation, now I can decree and declare that God's love for you, his desire for you to be successful, his desire for you to be the head and not the tail. Now I can decree and declare it because I picked the spot. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Some of us are in situations where we're really tempted because it seems like we're stuck with the lesser versus the greater. And I don't just mean money. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's, Lord, I've served you faithfully. And your word says that I deserve more than this. But it doesn't seem to be now. I should have the ability to pray this thing away. I should have the ability to call on you to save me in the way I think I need to be saved and it happens. But sometimes we're still stuck going through the completion of the trial. But we are tried by fire so we can come out as pure gold. Just like Jacob, God might be demonstrating through the course of our life that greater is possible, but greater is not going to come by being like everybody else. Greater isn't going to come by getting what we work for. Greater isn't going to come by getting what we deserve. Greater is going to come because we pick this spot to say, no matter what, I have no out. God, I'm serving you. I'm faithful to what you called me to do. And if there's no evidence, <laughs> if there's no satisfaction, if there's no justification, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it every day. I'm going to do it when it's unpopular. I'm going to do it when it's tough. I'm going to do it when no one's looking. I'm going to do it with no one's clapping. I'm going to do it when people are, are heckling me. I'm going to do it when people are tempting me because I pick this spot. Like Caleb, we can declare, Lord, give me this mountain. But we can declare it because he invited us to be overcomers through the word of our testimony. But the testimony is going to come with the test. And that test isn't going to be in just the timing that we want it to be. So today, I want to pray for the peace of God, 
for the endurance of God and for divine patience as we go through our tests and our trials. God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for picking us, for choosing us to go through this trial. While we may not know all of the reasons why you selected us, we stand and we honor your invitation. God, we are blessed that you would choose us, that you would choose our story, that you would choose our path. God, we're honored that you chose to use the demonstration of our life. And God, because you selected us, we choose you. We choose you every day. We choose you when the going gets tough. We choose you when we're outnumbered. We choose you when we're out of solutions. We choose you when we're justified by the eyes and the morality of the world. We choose you. We choose you against pressure. We choose you against loneliness. We choose you against anxiety. We choose you against stress. God, we choose you. We choose your will. We choose your way. We choose your methods. We choose you. We choose your righteousness. We choose the sanctified life that you are calling us to. We choose you. And God, today we declare that this is the spot where you show yourself strong. In our weakness, you are strong. God, we recognize that we need strength. We recognize that we need patience. We recognize that we need endurance. We recognize that we need restraint. We recognize, God, that we need your confidence. Sometimes it just, it just seems like we're, we're out without guidance, without a covering, that we're just vulnerable. But the devil is a liar. We are not without covering. We are not without comfort. We're not without peace. We're not without safety. We're not without security. We are not without your favor in our lives. Give us the strength, God. And if you, not if, when you bring us through, we're going to give your name the praise. We're going to give your name the honor. And we're going to give your name all of the glory. And we start today. Somebody give God glory right there. Give God praise right there. It may not seem like the time or season in your life where you should be saying thank you, but say thank you when you don't feel it. Give God glory. Come on, come on. Lift up your voice in praise and worship. We want to seal this with the confidence of our praise. Lift up your hearts to him. Lift up your fears to him. Lift up your insecurities to him. To the only wise God and Savior be glory and honor, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. When I was driving here, the Lord spoke to me about you, Sister Margaret, and you, Dr. S. And I said, Lord, I hear you. And you know how we do. If this is really you, when I get up to preach, let it come back just the same way you said it. And as I ended that prayer, he brought it back the same way he said it. Because we talked about this before. I don't do this whole, I got to prophesy to prove or to demonstrate or because everybody seems like they're doing it. So I said, Lord, if I'm hearing your voice, bring it back to me. And I haven't thought about it since I was on just getting off on King's Highway. I said, bring it back to me the same way that you're saying it now. And he just did. Sister Margaret, the Lord is saying there's things that are going on in your life that you cannot control. And it seems like there's nothing you can do about it. And he says two things. He says, there's nothing for you to do except to listen and to model forgiveness. Listen and model forgiveness. And the things that you can't control, he's going to control. 
the things that you can't get your hands and arms around a solution for, he's going to do it. And the reason why you feel helpless is because he's going to control it. He said, the only two things that you need to do, the only two things, you're praying and you're asking, what can I do? What should I do? What can I say? How can I get to them? How can I break these walls down? How can I restore it? He said, the only two things you need to do is listen to them and model forgiveness. That's what the Lord says to you today. Come on, give God worship right there for speaking to the situation. Lord, we praise you for your word. We honor your word. We honor the answers to your prayers because you don't miss. You're not inaccurate. You're not hovering in the ballpark. You speak directly to it. And Lord, we thank you that you've seen it. We thank you that you've seen it. Come on, just go into a worship right there. Just go into a worship. All you have to do is receive the word of the Lord. You don't have to say the right thing. All you have to do is say thank you and be obedient to that word. Come on, somebody give a worship with her today. Give a worship with her today. Give a worship with her today. Come on, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I don't know how long she's prayed. I don't know how long she was waiting on an answer. But Lord, I thank you for delivering that answer to your prayers. Lord, I thank you. I lift up my voice and just say thank you. Because when you send your word, solutions are coming. Answers are coming. Victory is coming in the name of Jesus. And as you said it, we will be obedient to your word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus for turning it around. Thank you, oh God, for moving things I couldn't move. Thank you for strength that I don't have in myself. Thank you for answers and solutions that I couldn't reach. Somebody give God praise. Give God praise. God give praise. Dr. S, she's in her moment, and the Lord says to you, much more simple, he says, your gifts are safe in here. That's all he said. Your gifts are safe in here. You don't have to defend them. You don't have to guard them. And you don't have to protect them. I know you've had to do it all. You've had to defend, guard, protect, plan, execute. But he says... Your gifts are safe in here. And all of that energy, that mental energy, the energy of your spirit, the energy of your heart to protect what's pure, that energy can go to something else here because your gifts are safe in here. That's all the Lord says. Just rejoice over the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The enemy would cause me to be drained by fighting battles I don't have to fight, by putting my energy and my resources in places that I don't have to. But I'm safe in your arms. I'm protected. You see me. You cover me. And wherever you send me, you don't send me into destruction. You don't send me into the desolation. You don't send me in the enemy's camp and leave me abandoned. You are a fortress. The righteous, the righteous, the righteous run in and they're saved. Thank God for the strong tower, the strong tower, the strong tower, the strong tower. We need your power. 